asking, and no, I did not forget her for the third time, but I hope I won't forget her afterward. But uh, this song you may uh, be familiar with that she's going to sing. I believe it was originally sung by Twyla Paris a number of years ago, and it is very appropriate for communion. So we felt like the best place for it is right before we observe communion. And so she'll sing how beautiful the end. But we're going to have our message and then after that our invitation and then she will sing and we'll be partaking of the Lord's Supper today. If you have your Bibles, would you turn this morning to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to be reading about the first 17 or 19 verses of uh, this chapter in, in just a moment. You know, Sudoku is, or Sudoku is a logic-based number placement puzzle that some of you may be familiar with. Very interestingly, uh, this puzzle, while it seems somewhat new to me, was actually created, uh, the concept of it, in 1979, just four years after the Rubik's Cube. And if you've ever been involved in working a Sudoku puzzle, it consists of a grade. It's made up of nine rows and nine columns and nine boxes. And in the traditional puzzle, there are 81 numbers and 81 placements. There are nine of each, numbered one through nine. And as you work that particular puzzle, you have to be sure you take the numbers one through nine in each row. There's only one number. One of those nine numbers is not repeated. Each column, one of the nine is not repeated. In each box, one of the nine is not repeated. And believe it or not, there seem to be an infinite number of puzzles. If you've ever gotten the puzzle book, uh, that's printed. There's Sudoku 1 and then 2 and then 3 and then 4 and then 5 and that's just one production company. There are others that do it and so it seems to be an infinite number of puzzles and it can be very difficult to work these puzzles. You have to sort of practice them. Uh, I um, have a smartphone now and I'm getting more and more used to it but I still only have one game app and that's Sudoku. So if you come to my house in the evening, I might be sitting in my recliner and I'm looking at my phone working that and Karen's doing the more popular wordscapes. And so uh, we both do that to sharpen our mind. But in the particular one that is on my phone, there are six levels and uh, some of those, I'll be honest, I have not attained and I will confess it and be very honest. Uh, but there is, of course, the easy, the medium, the hard, the expert, the master, and the extreme. When you get to the last three, you have to really be something. I haven't reached that level yet, okay? Because all I want to do is just keep my mind sharp, and I don't want a PhD in Sudoku puzzle making. But actually, even the hard ones sometimes can take, <clears throat> if you're not used to it, even up to a couple of hours or longer to, to work out. And especially if uh, you don't cheat, you know. Um, but it's very interesting as you think about there are various puzzles that we all have and there are easier levels and there are harder levels. I remember with the Rubik's Cube, when I got that, I was so happy when I could just get one side with all of one color. And then I realized my friend could do all of them uh, very quickly. But you know, many times the Bible seems like a puzzle, doesn't it? There, there are parts of the Bible that are easy to understand. Notice I'm saying easy to understand, not necessarily easy to practice, but we clearly understand what a passage teaches. There's no doubt about it. And it's very concrete, it's very direct. But then there are other portions of the Bible that can be very complicated to understand. And one of those chapters happens to be the chapter that we're looking at today, not so much the chapter itself, but the person upon which uh, Hebrews chapter seven is focusing, a man named Melchizedek. Not only is it difficult to know how to spell the man's name, as we look at him in scripture, in many ways he's a, a mystery, an enigma, to understand who this person is. This mysterious figure first appears in Genesis chapter 14 as he is engaged in a work or conversation with Abraham. He is then mentioned one other time in the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 110 and verse 4 where he is attached very closely to Jesus Christ. And other than those two portions of scripture, which are few, he is only mentioned elsewhere 
in the New Testament book of Hebrews. And we're going to look at this mysterious person today. We're going to see what distinguishes him. We're going to consider what he did, who he was, even though there are parts of that that I'll be honest, we cannot understand. And, and finally, we'll understand how he is a type of Jesus Christ. And we'll see how the order of Melchizedek is superior to that of the Levitical order and how Jesus is associated with this Old Testament priest and what that really means. To us. So look with me at Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God most high, met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi who received the priestly office have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is from their brothers and sisters, though they have descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage of Abraham collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises without a doubt the inferior, that is Abraham, is blessed by the superior, that is Melchizedek. In the one case, men who die will receive a tenth. That's the Levitical priest. But in the other case, scripture testifies that he, Melchizedek, lives. And in a sense, Levi himself, those are the Old Testament priests who receive a tenth, has paid a tenth through Abraham. For he was still within his ancestor, Abraham, when Melchizedek met Abraham. Now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron? <clears throat> For when there's a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. For the one these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. No one from it has served at the altar. Now it's evident <clears throat> that our Lord came from Judah. And Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. And this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who did not become a priest based on a legal regulation about physical descent. <clears throat> but based on the power of an indestructible life, for it has been testified, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the previous command is annulled because it was weak and unprofitable. For the law protect, perfected nothing, but a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, as we look at... Uh, this unique priesthood of which Jesus was a part, prepare our hearts to partake from your table. Lord, we serve a high priest who is greater than any Old Testament high priest. We serve a king who is greater than any other king that has ever walked the face of the earth. And so Lord, we thank you for Jesus who brought the perfect sacrifice, his own life, and through perfection, Lord, and through our faith, we can be in right standing with you. And so, Father, we pray for your truth to be revealed to our heart as we study this. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, today we are observing the Lord's Supper, and <clears throat> this observance commemorates, rather, the death of Jesus at Calvary. And we don't observe this ordinance every week. There's some denominations, some groups that observe it every week. We observe it usually about every three to four months. It's a very sacred thing that Jesus himself ordered that those who would follow him would partake of. And so as we do that today, we do so with great reverence. And, but as we think about the Lord's Supper, as we uh, partake in, in this, uh, we're, we're taking in a unique way, as you've had distributed to you, hopefully by the ushers, uh, the little uh, uh, compartments there. Um, but as we partake of this, 
it merely is a representation of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood that was given for us. There's nothing magical in the formula about it. There's nothing, it's not transformed into anything in the moment. But we understand that this is a sacred observance. So when we partake of it, we're understanding that uh, the juice represents the blood of Christ that was shed at Calvary, and the bread represents, and, and that being that unleavened bread, the sinless body of Christ that was broken for us. And as we remember it, uh, it is a memorial. Jesus, or Paul said, that we're to do until Jesus returns. But it helps us as we look at this and as we prepare for it. It helps us to understand more about what Jesus' sacrifice really represented. And there's nowhere better we can understand that than to look at Scripture. And that's where we're looking today in Hebrews chapter 7. The book of Hebrews is a unique book in all of the New Testament. And really, uh, whenever you study a book, you want to understand what is really the gist of this book. What is the purpose of this book? The writer, what is he intending uh, to set forth as a thesis, as an overall direction of the book? And, and it's no mistaking uh, what the writer of Hebrews is trying to do. You can see it throughout. He is establishing the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no one like him. In fact, he, the writer of Hebrews compares him to the angels that he's greater than the angels. To Moses in the Old Testament law, he's greater than Moses in the Old Testament law. He compares him to all of the prophets and, and, and he compares him even to Joshua. And so as we look at this, we see throughout the book, he is establishing that Jesus is superior to any created being because Jesus is eternally God. And so he doesn't stop just with these that I've mentioned, but one area that he speaks about is how Jesus as our great high priest is, exceeds and supersedes any of that which we read in the scripture. So this morning, I want to do a comparison between the order of priesthood of which Jesus was a part to what we would call the Levitical priesthood. And that is that unique part of the tribe of Levi that served as priests in the temple. And we're going to see how uh, that was a weakened, as the scripture says, a less than desirable. It served its purpose, but again, it was exceeded and superseded by the work of Jesus Christ. So as we look today at Melchizedek and we compare the order of Melchizedek to the order of Levi, the first thing I want to note this morning is that Melchizedek's priestly order was far greater. Now it's very clear that Jesus is closely attached to this figure, Melchizedek. And again, I don't pretend to know everything about Melchizedek because in my understanding, he is the most difficult figure really to understand because he just appears and he appears and he's mentioned briefly. And then we read what the writer of Hebrews has to say about him. And we say, oh, I wish that I'd known he came from this line, that this was his father, that this was his mother. I wish I'd known that this was where he was raised. And many of our other figures in the Bible, we can say, well, we know Paul uh, of Tarsus. Saul was of Tarsus. We know that Jesus uh, was born in Bethlehem and in Nazareth, even though we know that Jesus eternally is God. Yet we see this uh, uh, figure, Melchizedek, who is really a mystery. And so we see him first in Genesis chapter 14, and he is interacting with Abraham. And there are two things that we see. We see two acts described. One is the act of Melchizedek upon Abraham, and the other is the act of Abraham unto Melchizedek. And so you say, why is that important? Why is Abraham important? Abraham was revered by the Jews. He was the father of the Jewish people. And so if, if the writer of Hebrews could establish Melchizedek's position with Abraham, it would, it would further strengthen his argument. So, so what do we see here? Let's first look at how Melchizedek in Genesis four, uh, 14, how he acted toward Abraham. It tells us there that he blessed Abraham. Now, what had happened back in Genesis chapter 14? Uh, Abraham had gone out. He had fought against four 
kings. He had defeated them. I mean, God was empowering Abraham. Uh, the kings of Sodom and all them, they were leaning on Abraham. Abraham was the one who was their triumphant leader. And so he comes back from battle and he has defeated these four kings. We might say in our day, Abraham was really something what he accomplished. But it's very important to note that at this point, he meets Melchizedek. And Melchizedek blesses him. Now, something that's very important as we look at this figure, Melchizedek, he was both a priest and a king. Do you see the semblance here? Jesus both is our high priest, but he also is king. He is our savior and he is our Lord. So Melchizedek was both a priest and a king. As the king of Salem, he was what? the kingdom or the ruler of peace, Jesus, the prince of peace. Uh, we know that he was priest to the most high God in, in verse uh, 18 of Genesis chapter 14. And so here Melchizedek is there before Abraham and he blesses Abraham. And then we read in Hebrews chapter seven and verse seven, the writer says, without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. What is he saying there? Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. Now for you and me, that may not mean much, but for the Jewish faith and for those of the Jewish faith, those who had an understanding of the Jewish background, they would say Abraham is the highest. And the writer here is saying Melchizedek is greater than he is. And so again, we go to the Old Testament sacrificial system and every year people would come to priests who were from the tribe of Levi and they would bring their offerings and they would feel good about that and they would feel that if that aroma went up to the Lord and was acceptable, they were in right standing with God. But we're going to see today the writer of Hebrews says, while that may make you feel good and may be good, it's not enough. It's not superior. There's something that's greater. And so here, Melchizedek blesses Abraham, and so he's greater than Abraham. Now follow this uh, argument here, and, it, and, and if you're ever a mathematician, it's called the transitive property, which is a big word of saying this. If A is greater than B, and B is greater than C, then A is greater than C. And so what he's saying is this, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Everybody would agree with that. All right. Abraham is greater than Levi. How could Abraham be greater than Levi? There was no Levi without Abraham. There would be no Levi. And so Abraham was greater than Levi. So if, if Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, Abraham is greater than Levi. Guess what? Melchizedek is greater than Levi. Now, why would he bother making this comparison? What he is trying to say is this priestly order who people had, uh, observed for so many years while it was good, it was not the ultimate. There's one that's greater. Guess what his name is? Jesus. He's of the order of Melchizedek. He, he's eternal. And so we see here that this argument the writer is establishing here is all of those animals that were sacrificed, all of those uh, individuals who were from the tribe of Levi, they didn't cover sin. But there is one who is greater who once for all did that. Now we see Melchizedek to Abraham. He said, I bless you, Abraham. The greater blesses the lesser. But let's look at Abraham to Melchizedek. What does he do? He tithes to Melchizedek. So here's Abraham. He comes and he has all the plunder as much as he can get from the four kingdoms that he defeated. And all of that's there. And he takes a portion of that, a tenth of that, and he bestows it upon Melchizedek, he gives it to him. And, and so verse four really tells us how great he is. Now consider how great this man Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the plunder to him. He, he gave to him. He gave of the plunder. Now, now this can be confusing here. I'll be the first to say it. But Abraham tithed to Melchizedek and then in a very interesting commentary, we see in verse 9 that indirectly Levi, that would be the Old Testament priests, were tithing to Melchizedek. Look at verse 9. 
Well, verse 8, in the one case, men who die will receive a tenth. That would be um, the Levitical priest. But in the other case, Scripture testifies that he, that is uh, Melchizedek, lives. And in a sense, verse 9, Levi himself who receives a tenth has paid a tenth through Abraham, for he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek was born. Now this sounds strange. It's hard for us in our thought to understand. But what he is saying here is that this priest, Melchizedek, was so great that Abraham gave him a tenth. And guess what? Levi, who was still in his forefather's uh, body, yet to be born, in a sense, was giving. So when Abraham was giving, what he's saying is, in essence, Levi, who would come later, is giving. What is that establishing again? That Melchizedek is greater than Levi. That Melchizedek in his order is greater. L look at what it says there in verse 10. Let's, let's look at it again, because this is important. For he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. He, he, he is saying personally here, even though Levi was yet to be born, he was within his ancestor. And so we see that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, who was greater than Levi. So the order of Melchizedek is of a greater order than that of, of Levi. Now let's look at a second truth of Melchizedek. His eternal nature is unparalleled and thus it's greater. You know, there's some things that we know about Melchizedek and some things that we don't. Some people believe that his appearance in Genesis chapter 14 is something that's called a theophany. That is a, an appearance of God in form of the Old Testament. It'd be like when Daniel's three friends were in the fiery furnace and the king, and they saw that there was one like a fourth, like the son of the gods. That was the theophany. But I'm not sure that this is a theophany. I was studying some, and, and again, this is complicated things to understand. But one of my professors in seminary said it's really not a theophany, but he is really a type of Christ. Look at chapter 7 in verse 3 here in Hebrews. It says he's without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He didn't call him the Son of God. We might use it in our language like the Son of God, which is a simile. When you use a simile, you're not saying that feature for feature he's the exact, but you might say in this aspect, you might say he runs like a deer. It doesn't mean that he runs with four legs, but it means that he runs very fast. And so when he's resembling the Son of God, it doesn't equate him totally with the Son of God, but this aspect of this mysterious, aspect of living, of no one knowing who his father, who his mother was. And so really his nature was timeless. When we say he was eternal, we would in a sense have to make him God. And I don't think that's what the writer here is trying to do. But what he's saying is here is this mysterious figure, uh, Melchizedek, no one knows where he came from. No one knows from whom he was born. There's no record of him dying, but he existed and he lived to carry out that act toward Abraham that was a significant act. And so in verse 8, we see that his work, which lives forever, is compared to the work of Levi. And in verse 8, it says, in the one case, men who will die receive a tenth. Who would that be? The priests of the tribe of Levi, the Old Testament priests. But in the other case, the scripture testifies that he lives. And so what he's saying here again, that this order, the order of Melchizedek, not only is it greater, but it lasts forever. It doesn't stop. And he lives forever. I love that song of, uh, of Jesus. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me uh, along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. He lives within our heart, but he lives beyond that. And so we see here that our faith, our salvation, our, our dependence on forgiveness is not based on an order of death, but from an order of life.
So if people were depending on these human beings born of the tribe of Levi to make right standing with God, the problem was they themselves had to offer sacrifice for their own sins. They weren't perfect. They themselves would die and have to be replaced with another. It wasn't enough. And the scripture teaches that they needed a higher order. And that order was Melchizedek. Look at verse 23. And that's beyond our text today. Now many in chapter 7 of Hebrews, have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. In other words, there are a lot of these. There are a dime a dozen, you might say. There are a lot of Levitical priests because one would live, he would die, then there would be another line that would come. But notice what it says. But because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them. And that leads to the third point this morning. Not only because of that relationship of Abraham to Melchizedek do we see that Melchizedek was greater than the Old Testament uh, priest. Not only do we see because he is eternal that he's greater than the Old Testament priest who would die and would have to be replaced, but his work exceeds and supersedes the work of the Levitical priest. We, we've looked at Melchizedek's person. There's no mention of a genealogy. We also note that he's greater than Abraham. And importantly, we see that his nature is like that of Jesus and Jesus being of a higher order. And the writer here in verse 14 says every other priest that would be uh, coming on the scene would have been of the tribe of Levi, but Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. But what about the work of this line of Melchizedek? The writer here compares him to that, the work of Levi. And unlike Levi, his work is complete. Notice what verse 11 says in, in Hebrews 7. Now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear according to the order of Melchizedek? What he's saying here, he's given an argument. If, if the Old Testament priest could have made people right with God, why would Jesus have come? And that's important. Think about this. If you could save yourself, why did Jesus come to the earth? If anyone else could save you, why would Jesus have come to this earth? He alone is Savior. His work is unique. For when there's a change of the priesthood, verse 12, there must be a change of the law as well. For the one that these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. Again, verse 14, the tribe of Judah. So Jesus of the order of Melchizedek. But then we see that his order's work, that is Melchizedek's work, is greater in power and authority. Notice again what we read in verses 23 through 25. He, he lives forever. Uh, verse 15, and this becomes clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who didn't become a priest based on a legal regulation about physical descent, but the power of an indestructible life. In other words, the doctor is in. In other words, when Jesus, he always lives. He's, he, he never sleeps. He's always there. He has an indestructible life. The priest that, that a Jew may have gone to a number of years ago, he would have died. But Jesus lives forever and he's always available. But this is important as we prepare to close. Look at verse 18. So the previous command, that is the command associated with the Levites, is annulled because it was weak and unprofitable. In other words, it did not accomplish what the people thought it would accomplish. Elsewhere in the book of Hebrews, it says, listen to this, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away the sin. It was imperfect, it was weak, and it failed. Day after day, Month after month, year after year, the Old Testament priests would practice uh, offering the sacrifice, none of which could take away the sin. There's only one sacrifice. In comparison, Jesus died once for all sin, once for all sin. Verse 27, 
He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as the high priest do first for their own sins and then for those of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. There's one thing before we close as we look at this order of Melchizedek that appeared to me this week, and it's this. Melchizedek is mentioned, and he's gone. What did he do? One act. He blessed Abraham. There's nowhere else, and I know this is an argument from silence, there's nowhere else that Melchizedek is mentioned, well, he carried out this, he carried out that. He is mentioned, and then he's gone. He, he's mentioned in, in Psalm 110.4 as it refers back to that. And so in that, Melchizedek is a picture of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, that one sacrifice was good enough, and he would bless those who would believe him. That's all it takes. There's, it's not the continual offering of the sacrifices of animal. It's not depending on priests who themselves were, were people just as we are who would die, who had to offer sacrifices for themselves. No, Jesus is of a higher order, an eternal life, no beginning, no end, eternally God, greater than the father Abraham, greater than any human being. He exceeds. He didn't come from uh, Abraham. He blessed Abraham. Levi came from Abraham. Jesus is greater. What does all of this mean? As we go back to Melchizedek, he was a priest and he was a king. And you know what? Jesus, along with being a prophet, was a priest and a king. He is the priest, the only high priest. He offered his life for you. The only way you can be made right with God is through Jesus Christ. But guess what? He is also king. He is a king, which means he's Lord of your life. You know what God is asking you to do today? Trust Jesus Christ. Trust the one who has no beginning no end. Trust the one who is eternal. Trust the one who is greater than any human being. Trust the one who through one interaction, one act, was able to secure the salvation for those who would believe in him. I wonder, would you believe in him today? Would you say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust him. I don't depend on any man who would fail me. I don't depend on any order that is a lesser order. I depend on Jesus Christ and him alone. I wonder if you would trust him today. Let's pray. Father, as we've looked at what is, to me at least, a, 